Hello and welcome to the France 24 interview. I'm Annette Young. 20 years ago in Beijing, the UN rolled out its Platform for Action, an initiative that sought to empower women worldwide. One of the stars of that summit was the then First Lady, Hillary Clinton, who made the famous declaration that women's rights are human rights. But years later, she did go on to say that gender equality remains the great unfinished business of the 21st century. So as we mark International Women's Day in 2015, where exactly do we stand 20 years on? And here with me in the studio today is the head of UN Women, Fumzila Melamo Nekuka. Fumzila, thank you so much for thank being you. with us. So, 20 years on from that Beijing initiative, how much have attitudes changed? Uh, the glass is half empty in the sense that uh, we have seen some progress, very uneven and very slow. Uh, in education, for instance, most countries made tremendous uh, progress, especially those that started at the bottom. Uh, we moved from countries where girls were about 30% of uh, enrollment uh, by girls uh, to 70 percent. In some countries we've reached uh, equal 50-50 between boys and girls, but we have high dropout rate, so we still have problems to fix. Access to health facilities has significantly improved, and that is why infant mortality is uh, dropping. And we saw a lot of institutions that countries created to address gender equality. That was the era of women's ministries, women's commissions, uh, gender focal points, uh, access to justice for issues related to women, uh, new laws to uh, address violence against women. But implementation, has not been as good as the laws. Now, recently we saw the American actress uh, Patricia Arquette stand up when she got her Academy Award to talk about the need for women's equality and, more importantly, the need to close the wage gap, which just goes to show, even in highly developed countries, we've still got a long way to go, haven't we? There is no country that has reached gender parity uh, because uh, uh, gender inequality is in different facets. It's in the economy, it's at home, it's in professions. More girls and women in developed countries are graduating from universities. But when you get into companies at the top echelons, you do not see that many women. So stereotypes and prejudices are still there. And that is why we need men to be involved because uh, they are the pen holders. They are the ones that make a lot of decisions that leave women out. There's an increased number of men that are becoming gender activists that are speaking out, but uh, we need a critical mass. We haven't reached the tipping point. I want to talk about that a little bit later, but uh, when you talk about who scores high when it comes to gender equality, the Nordic countries always seem to be you know, occupying those top positions. Have there been any other surprise performers in recent years? Well, they have been countries that have uh, progressed. I mean, you have a country like Bangladesh, uh, which has demonstrated that uh, involving women in the economy, even if it's, uh, they've started at a very low base, is very good for poverty reduction. You have a country like Rwanda, which has the highest number of uh, members of uh, uh, parliament in the world. Uh, you also have uh, countries such as the Caribbean, where access to education uh, between boys and girls has increased uh, quite uh, significantly. So it's a mix, it's a very mixed picture, but there definitely are nice surprises in, in, in some parts of the world. Now, you were just saying there about the need to get women involved, and I did an interview last year with the noted American feminist, Amory Slaughter, who said the next phase of the women's movement is indeed the men's movement. How, in fact, do we work at getting more men to sort of climb on board? You know, as the executive director of UN Women, I am spending a lot of time working with men and reaching out to men because you need the, the one half of humanity to work to address the issue of the other half of humanity because then we will be able to sort out issues for everybody because discrimination against women also harm the capacity of men to be better people. Uh, so we have launched a campaign called He For She, where we are reaching out to men and encouraging them to come out as gender activists and to act 
uh, firstly to start by signing up as Hifushi, which they can do on, 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 online, hifushi.org. But offline, they must then take action. If they are CEOs of companies, we are asking them to go to the treasurer of their companies and to look at whether there is equal pay for equal work between the sexes in their companies. If they are heads of state, we are asking them to do something unparalleled in their country to address issues that are hurting women in their own countries. But isn't it sort of not a case of a, a generational revolution in the fact that men of my age, mm. that much older, have much more in common with their fathers than women of my age have with our mothers. So as a result, it's perhaps younger men who grow up, particularly in the developed world, with working mothers who see sort of the rise of women in, in the workplace as not as a threat. Y yes, but at the same time, we cannot just concentrate on the younger men because the people who are CEOs who are perpetuating unequal pay are the older men. So we need to deal with them now because otherwise we are prejudicing the women uh, today. Heads of states are not young men. They are old men and sometimes very old men. But yet they make very significant decisions uh, that impact on women. So we need to engage them now to make the changes. So what would you say to those men who claim that we're sort of now overcompensating? for women? Well, you, we just should tell them that only 5% of women in the world are CEOs of top 1,000 fortune companies. Surely it is not because there isn't women. We, I think we should tell them the majority of the people who are poor are women disproportionately. We must tell them that there's one billion women who live with violence, with one out of three women uh, likely to face physical or sexual violence. We must tell them that it is more dangerous in some countries to be a man, to be a woman, sorry, than to be a soldier when there is a conflict, because the conflict targets women to humiliate them, to rape them, to kill them. And that is why the majority of people who suffer when there is a conflict or a disaster, it's women. So but we have seen a sort of pushback, if you like. We have seen a backlash against feminism, haven't we, in the last y 20 years? Yes, we have seen. That is why we've got to get the men to be also part of the struggle. We need the men's movement so that it's kind of like, you know, dude to dude. It's not us talking to men. It's also men talking together. And I believe that we're seeing more men now that are willing to stand up and to say, I'm a feminist. I think that is very refreshing. Now, we were just talking earlier about some of the different uh, countries that have proved to be surprise performers, but there's still a very much a distinct gap between the developed world and the developing world. Are we ever going to be able to close that gap when it comes to well, the status of women? It is also, I think that the gap is very much linked to just the level of development and availability of resources because uh, uh, gender inequality is also about uh, resources. I think that the, the prejudices in developed countries are, are, are also uh, intense. So it's important that uh, in the developing countries we address the uh, gender inequality there because progress that is achieved there impacts positively on the progress that could be achieved in the developing countries. Uh, but uh, the challenges in developing countries is much bigger because of the levels of poverty. The pain is that much stronger. But having said that, there are certain practices that are much more uh, uh, prominent in developing countries that are far reaching on women, like early and early child marriages, because that just kills the life of a child at a very early age, uh, or, or genital mutilation. That also uh, is deforming, is harmful, and you, and you can never quite uh, get that, uh, the life of the girl back in the same way. So yes, there are areas where uh, uh, the, the challenges are much bigger in developing countries, but we actually need to do this universally because every country has something to fix. Now, coming back to the developed world, there's a very strong chance that the US could indeed have a female president. However, when you look at the representation of women across the world at a political level, it's still very poor. Even in the U UN, yeah. I would say yeah. it's an issue. Again, what needs to be done to overcome that? Well, for one, women's movement has to continue to do what it has done for so many years. Uh, advocate, uh, we need to support the women, uh, 
but also we need to call for greater investment in women's work because one of the things that has happened in the last 20 years is that notwithstanding that the issues of the women became more prominent, that institutions were established, but they were grossly underfunded. As a result, the impact is not as good as, as it can be. But then I go back uh, uh, to men. Men in political parties, which is where the exclusion of women uh, starts, need to stand up and support special measures to bring women uh, to the uh, decision making. But it's also about networking and that's where it becomes problematic, doesn't Abs it? Absolutely, because uh, uh, men may network amongst men and leave women out. And uh, it is going to take other men who will say, I refuse, for instance, to sit in a panel where we make decisions for everybody and women are not there. A man must say, I will not marry a child. Finally, where do you think we should be 20 years from now, Vumzilla? 20 years from now, we have to have reached a point where we have reduced unpaid care work for women. We should be in a place where we have got much higher representation in boards in parliaments, all of those things are actually doable and are not impossible. We should be at a place where access to education for boys and girls has reached parity and we have removed the stereotypes that education perpetuates, which keep on reinforcing what we are trying to, to, to fight against. And of course, we must have closed the gender pay gap. Bunzila, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much. And that's it for this program. Do stay with us here on France 24. Thank you.